So hello everyone and welcome. My name is Nola Wanta. I am the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy um, at the College of Business Administration here at LMU. And so I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our Grosh Lecture Series. Uh, but before we get started, I'd just like to go over our general webinar guidelines. So for today's webinar, we do ask that you type your questions in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. And depending on the flow of the questions in the presentation, some of the questions may be asked um, during the presentation. Also use the chat window to post your comments or insights only, please. And as a friendly reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce our Paul A. Grosch Grosh, Professor of Accounting, Professor Rosemary Kim, who will kick us off. Rosemary. Thank you, Nola. First of all, I would like to thank the College of Business, including Nola and Nancy and Natalie and Roberta and our Associate Dean Calvers and our Dean Smith for all your help and support in pre preparing for this event. I also want to thank the Paul A. Grosh supporters. This event would not be possible without all of you. So thank you very much. And now a little background about our distinguished speaker. Dr. Timothy Headley is a senior advisor to K2 Integrity, which is an investigation and risk advisory practice. With more than 25 years of experience, he provides clients with a wide range of forensic services to assist with the prevention detection and response to governance and integrity issues. He also works with companies to respond to allegations of fraud or misconduct involving earnings management, bribery, cor uh, corruption and kickbacks, counterfeiting, construction fraud, Ponzi schemes, and employee theft, just to name a few. Prior to his work with K2 Integrity, Dr. Headley was a forensic practice partner at KPMG, where he served as global lead for the firm's fraud risk management services. To stay connected to academia, he is a lecturer at Fordham University and Fairfield University and has authored numerous articles and books. You could find him on YouTube discussing fraud risk management. To give back to the profession, he serves as a board member and the treasurer of the Connecticut Society of CPAs. He holds a PhD in public management with focus in accounting and control, a master's in accounting from the State University of New York at Albany, and a bachelor's from Siena College in New York. He's a CPA in three states, Connecticut, New York, and Maryland, and is a certified fraud examiner as well. Tim has had numerous speaking engagements, and we are very fortunate to have him as our Grosh speaker this evening. Tim, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And I did not realize I was on YouTube until you mentioned it. <laughs> so um, a, a good due diligence on your part. Is um, my screen showing okay before we go any further? Yes. Okay, just should be one screen. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, and thank you very, very much for uh, having me here to speak. Uh, I think it's a, a terrific honor. It's a great program you had. And you've had some tremendous speakers uh, over the years. They're very impressive. So to join those ranks is, again, a great honor for me. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about our chat, a little bit about organizational integrity breakdowns. Uh, a lot of this, most of this is just based on my experience having been involved in this space for, oh, 20 some years. And I'll share with you some of my experiences and things that I've learned and, and what have you. Uh, during this session, I believe we're going to take some breaks if, if, uh, if, if people have questions. I have no problem answering as many questions as people have. I am not wedded to my slides. If I don't get to them uh, all, that is fine. If I get to one slide and that's it, that is fine as well, as long as we all get something out of the presentation. Thank you. So anyway, um, the agenda. Uh, first, we're going to talk, uh, we're going to actually define a couple of terms. Uh, after that, we are going to chat about the seriousness, seriousness of misconduct and fraud. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about co what companies do to mitigate these risks. Uh, I've got a couple of case studies I'm going to talk about, a couple of interesting fellows, uh, people I actually know fairly well. 
And uh, we're going to end on uh, the notion of pos uh, possessing a doubting state of mind. Uh, and that, that part of it is actually I have here on the agenda. It's a professional life lesson. And if you take nothing else away from my presentation, that is probably the most important thing. Okay, so what are fraud and misconduct? Uh, they seem like simple terms. Uh, there are no one definition that's widely accepted for either of them, uh, but there are a lot of definitions in court cases and in the literature and what have you, but I'll cover some of this. Uh, misconduct, unacceptable or improper behavior, especially by an employee or a professional person. Uh, we're talking about misconduct, we're talking about violations of rules, regulation, laws, the company's code of conduct, uh, mores, uh, the ethical standards for a particular profession, whatever it is, you're not following the rules, it's misconduct. Uh, fraud, I have a definition on the screen here, a form of human behavior, generally rely, or, uh, defined by the court as an intentional misrepresentation that was properly relied upon by the plaintiff and caused the plaintiff damages. Um, I don't really like that as a working definition. Uh, at least in my career, it's, it's kind of hard to think about relying upon it and uh, causing damages. Because you think about fraud and misconduct, and then what, are the, what, damage, what are the damages caused? You think about Enron, and you think about all the losses. How would you ever measure that? What, what were the, what, you know, what was relied upon, and what were the damages caused, and how were people hurt? Very hard to measure. So I like to consider an intentional deception that drains value from an organization. For as an intentional deception drains value from an organization. The key words be intent and deception. A fraud is the intent to deceive somebody. Um, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, what used to drive me crazy is people say, oh, it's, it's hidden fraud. Oh, by definition, fraud is hidden. It's a hidden crime. It's an absolutely hidden crime. That's why it's so difficult to actually measure you know, how much fraud there is in this world, how much how much actually takes place. I will get into that a little bit. One other type of uh, 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 misconduct I want to talk about is corruption. And, and, and corruption is influencing someone to do something contrary to his or her official or fiduciary responsibility. Okay, something that is contrary to their fiduciary responsibility. And this notion will become important a little bit later on as I work through some of my materials. Okay, prevalence of fraud and misconduct. So how big a problem is it? Um, you know, is, is it a big deal? Does it happen a lot? I've worked in my career on way over a thousand annual audits. It was always amazing to me that people who work with companies or whatever think, well, it can't be a big problem here. And I've worked with scores of companies directly in advisory capacity. Uh, we, we just don't have those problems. But you know what? Companies do have these problems. It just doesn't happen to other people. And when you think about how big the problem is, you, you sort of think to yourself, well, how do you measure these kinds of things? And it's very, very difficult. There are a lot of surveys out there. And I picked a few of them I want to share with you because these are ones I think I'm pretty impressed with the rigor of the surveys. The first one is from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, I love this survey. Uh, I'm really impressed by the rigor of this survey. And they asked their respondents, and there were thousands of them, so it's a global survey, I believe, and people from all levels of the organization, particularly a higher levels in the organization, and they asked them, in the last two years, have you experienced fraud? And it kind of amazing, 47%, nearly half of them said yes, they've had fraud in their organization. And the way my reading this survey is, it's not just like, okay, you know, someone cheated on their uh, uh, expense report or something. Uh, based on my reading the survey, you know, it's, it's bigger things than that, particularly the kinds of individuals that they surveyed, the stuff they became aware of, and it has some significance uh, to the organization for them to actually answer affirmatively, affirmatively to this. And to put a slightly finer point uh, on this survey and talking about the significance of how big a problem this is, they actually asked another question. Of those that have actually experienced fraud in the last uh, two years, how many frauds do they experience? 
Well, they actually experienced an average six incidents of fraud in their organization for each one of those that had fraud over the last two years. So it's a big problem, according to the PwC survey. It's a big problem. There's a lot of fraud going on, a lot of it. And again, the frauds we're talking about here, I don't think are those that we would consider de minimis kinds of frauds. Next survey I, I, I found in, uh, for this presentation uh, was uh, with Ernst & Young. And I actually thought this really had some interesting telling kinds of results. 11% of companies have experienced a significant fraud in the last two years. So the other survey said 47%, they're saying 11, but they're talking about what is defined as truly significant frauds in their organization in the last two years. I can tell you that 100% of all organizations have fraud at some level. And what they're saying here, the ones they became aware of, remember fraud is a hidden crime. It's a hidden event. But they became aware in 11% of these organizations of a significant fraud in their organization. 11% of respondents stated that it is common practice to use bribery to win contracts in their sector, in their industry. It's common practice to use bribes. And we're going back to that corruption definition I gave you before. That's what we're talking about. In this particular survey, they found 11% are saying in their sector, you know, people are actually bribing other people, okay? That could be commercial bribes. It could be kickbacks. It could be violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. 38% of respondents uh, stated that bribery, corrupt practices has occurred wildly in their business, uh, in their business, in their country. It's a global survey. And I don't know if how many of you are familiar with Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perception Index and Heat Map. If you actually have a chance to download and look at it, you'll see, wow, you know, some parts of the world are highly corrupt. And so you think I'm doing business there, I've got a business risk. But how, when you see that they are, the perceived level of corruption is high, it usually is highly correlated with other issues. And I understand many of you are, who are listening to me right now are business students, probably many of you accounting students. And I used to tell auditors you know, in the course of my career, if you're getting audit evidence from a part of the world that uh, the perceived level of corruption is very high, it calls into question the quality of that audit evidence. Okay, again, some really telling results, I think, from these surveys. The next survey is from KPMG. And this one is interesting to me in particular because for uh, almost two decades, it was actually involved in the um, um, administration of the survey. And the first thing KPMG did in its survey, they asked their respondents, and it's not that much different than the other surveys. The other surveys have thousands of respondents. Uh, this survey was only for the US. And the first question we asked people is have you seen misconduct in your organization in the last 12 months? Doesn't specify fraud, misconduct. Remember that broader definition I had of misconduct? We asked them that question, gave them a whole bunch of examples of what misconduct looks like. So 76%, three quarters of all the individuals came back and said, yep, I've seen misconduct. This survey was run for years. Every time it was run, the result was almost around three quarters. It didn't change. A lot of people saw misconduct in the organizations. I always thought that um, number was, was shocking to me. And when I would brainstorm fraud risk in the financial statement audit as a forensic professional, I would show the auditors numbers like this. To let them know, you know, raise an antenna and think about it. Hey, you know what? Misconduct in an organization is a real problem. There's no way you should think that your organization is free of these kinds of things. But again, this result always kind of made me wonder and others wonder, okay, Tim, you're talking about misconduct, you know, but how big a deal is it? Misconduct can be, you know, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't hurt the organization, what have you. So to think about that, we actually asked another question of that 76%, we, we asked them, if the misconduct they saw became public, would it lead to a significant loss of public trust? Would it lead to a significant loss of public trust? And astoundingly, three, um, sorry, 
three quarters of all the individuals, I'm sorry, uh, almost 70% of all the individuals answered affirmatively to that question. So not only are they seeing a lot of misconduct, those that are seeing misconduct, that con misconduct could lead to a significant loss of public trust. That means roughly half the people surveyed, in some years the survey pool was uh, 5,000, some years it was two, three, whatever it happened to be. Most of the people, or a good large proportion of the people saw misconduct in their organizations, but a lot of them saw misconduct that was serious in nature. So you saw the, P, uh, the PwC survey, you saw the UI survey, you saw the KPMG survey. The things I'm talking about here, fraud, misconduct, misbehaviors, what have you, are big, big problems for organizations. But again, this sort of begs another question. You know, we got all this stuff going on. Why is it happening? Why is this actually taking place? Why do we have these issues in an organization? So we asked that question to KPMG. You know, the misconduct you observed, why did it happen? And we gave the respondents a whole bunch of potential answers. And I'm going to give you two of them. I'm going to give you two of them. The first one listed here was actually answer number one. Feel pressure to do whatever it takes to meet business targets or meet business objectives. So people are committing misconduct because, wow, you know, there's a lot of pressure in companies to do things. A lot of pressure in companies to do things. The second answer I have here is actually number eight. It's number eight on the list. I didn't want to put them all in here, so I just put the two. First one is number one, the next one's number eight. And if you look at it, it says, are seeking to steal or bend the rules for their own personal gain. And when I first saw the result, they said, mm, that's almost counterintuitive. You think people do bad things in organizations for personal gain. Turns out not to be, always be the case. And all of the um, issues that became our clients, all the times I'd assisted with investigations or what have you, all the times I got involved in fraudulent financial reporting, all these issues, so much of it was actually driven by internal pressures in the organization, certainly the serious things, and not really driven by personal gain. So when I would uh, work with audit teams about considering the risk of fraud in the financial statement audit, I wouldn't be thinking about, you know, you know what could they get out of it? I'd be asking the audit teams, I said, what are the pressures that are under? What are the pressures that are under? And I'll get more to this a little bit later on. You can also look to other reasons why it happens. You see this, do what, uh, pressure, do whatever it takes. Uh, Walmart had done a lot of its own work, came up with lessons uh, from, from their research about why people do the wrong things. Uh, I think the first number one they had was uh, loyalty to a supervisor. You know, immediate loyalty to your supervisor was a huge driver of behaviors. Unchecked success. I'm very successful when I do. It's not checked. No one's really uh, um, uh, putting the reins on me and, and my behaviors and what have you. And an interesting thing about that, people don't question good news. Okay. A lot of the things that I've worked on or investigated in my career, kind of the company is paying attention because things weren't going well. It's amazing there were times where things on paper look like they're going very, very well. No one questions good news. Goal memorization would be another one. Uh, tunnel vision. They sort of really aren't thinking about what's going on around them. They have this tunnel vision about their jobs and their roles and what have you. A blind precedence. This is the way we've always done things. The way we will continue to do things. Uh, another one's isolated uh, teams or isolated performers, or also those that hey. Another lesson to learn, people who uh, are sort of over there someplace, no one's really paying a whole lot of attention to them, you know, more susceptibility to things going wrong. Nick Leeson, uh, from the, road, the famous road trader that brought down a Barings Bank off in Singapore. That was a perfect example. Man, it's all good news over there, doing great things, very isolated. Wow, he actually brought down uh, the investment house. Uh, there are other explanations. Uh, you've got like the broken window theory. Probably a lot of you have heard of that, particularly those of you who thought about the, uh, what was going on in New York City years ago and Giuliani and, um, you know, cleaning up the city. Uh, they practice this notion of the broken windows theory. Uh, I don't tolerate small things. If I don't tolerate small things, they don't lead to bigger things. By broken window, it essentially is a reference to, hey, the house next door is unoccupied, it's empty, and someone throws a rock through the window, 
and no one repairs it. The next thing you know, the whole house is coming apart and everything's a mess. But someone jumps in, makes a repair, takes care of the small things. In the case of an organization, small thefts, well, they can make a big difference. Uh, the Pygmalion effect is, a, is an interesting one. You act like you're treated. If people, in, if you're, you know, work for an organization, not well treated, they treat me like I'm a thief or potential thief. You know what? I may act that way because I'm treated that way. I'm going to act that way. Uh, a lot of times people view things as a zero sum game. It's winner take all. I'd rather cheat than lose. Again, that can be part of the culture of an organization. And I think you probably saw some of that with a company like Enron. Certainly, I know Andy Fastow and have many conversations with about what was going on there. And to me, the culture and the environment seemed like a zero sum game, winner take all. Uh, there's that documentary that I think it's called The Smartest Guys in the Room, uh, really worth uh, 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 watching. And they're, they're talking about that, you know, they're talking about, you know, if, if I need to do whatever to make it to the top um, and I need to step on a guy and they'll say, I'm going to stomp on his throat to get where I'm going. Again, zero sum game. And, you know, there's not a lot of wealth to go around. And, you know, whatever that, whatever I don't get, that person gets, whatever the person doesn't get, I can get. Um, nothing called the reactance theory. Um, and if, if, if you impose upon people, impose upon people, uh, they can go much further in their behaviors than they would naturally have gone. So you're putting a lot of pressure on them and doing things and treating them a certain way. Reactance theory suggests, you know what? They're gonna go a little bit further than, than they may have um, otherwise. So a lot of reasons why this stuff happens, but it happens. And for a company to actually, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, mitigate these risks, you, you, you really can't effectively mitigate things unless you understand why they're happening, how I can change the company, how I can change the, uh, the culture of an organization, what have you. You have to understand that if you actually want to mitigate these kinds of risks. You also have to understand, them. Uh, for those of you that are accounting students, you're going to be auditors, you have to understand these things too, about uh, what the risks are within your audit. When you're considering the risk of financial statement fraud, understanding these issues. Are people acting this way? Is this the way things are in this organization? It heightens the risk for, for the auditors. Okay, <clears throat> elements of misconduct. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is the fraud triangle. Most of you, many of you, have probably heard of it. You've seen it. Uh, I don't always agree with how it is taught in academic setting. Uh, but I can tell you, if you want to understand fraudulent behavior, you want to understand fraudulent behavior, you're going to have to have a visceral sense of what's on this slide. You have to have a visceral sense of what's on the slide. If you truly want to understand fraudulent behavior, if you want to take the lessons and things I just talk, I talked about and put them into effect, you really have to understand uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the triangle itself. Um, and thinking about it, you know, we've all heard a bit about it, or most of us probably heard about it. When you look at it, think about, you know, what does this really tell me? Well, it tells you a few things. First thing, opportunity. Conditions must exist to allow a fraud to occur. It is the only real necessary condition on the slide. If conditions aren't there to allow a fraud to exist, I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. It just, it's just not going to take place. But people would say, well, why can't we just eliminate the opportunities and fraud won't happen? Well, it doesn't work that way. The only way to truly keep fraud from happening in your organization is to take all your money Lock it in the safe and hire guards to watch it and hope you can trust them. But having to watch it, no one's going to touch your money. Fraud's not going to happen. But in the commercial context, your expenditures, okay, your expenses, your expenditures generate revenue. Unless you're using that money for something, you know what? You can't generate revenues. In the commercial context, that's the way this works. So you got to spend the money. You got to use the money. And as soon as you do that, opportunities will pop up. You can't eliminate them all. And I'll talk about a little bit that about a little bit later on. Next one's incentive pressures. Um, you kind of think about, you know, what does that really mean and how does it play a part when I'm considering the risk of fraud in an organization? Well, opportunity, you got the conditions. Some people see, well, you know what, condition here, I can maybe misappropriate some assets. I'll take advantage of it. But not all fraud starts with misappropriation. 
And most of the misconduct you saw in an earlier survey doesn't start with just the opportunity. Right? It starts with incentives and pressures. Fraudulent financial reporting starts with incentives and pressures. I can't remember a case in my whole career where someone committed fraudulent financial reporting only because the opportunity was there. I got a lot of asset misappropriation frauds that work that way, but fraudulent financial reporting starts there. Other kinds of misconduct. Just because they can engage in misconduct, well, why am I going to do that? There's some sort of incentive and pressure. For fraudulent financial reporting, number one reason a company engages in fraudulent financial reporting, according to the AAERs of the, of the SEC, those are the accounting and auditing enforcement releases at the SEC. Number one reason companies engage in fraudulent financial reporting, meet third-party analyst expectations. That's why they did it. Didn't do it because they had the opportunity. They did it because they had the, the, the pressure, some sort of incentive. Then they start looking for the opportunity where the, we can affect a fraud. Last thing here is rationalization. It's the toughest thing for people to get their arms around, rationalizing behavior. What does that really mean? Well, most of us don't have a moral compass that allows us to commit a fraud without being able to justify that fraud or other misconduct to ourselves or others. Now, why might that be important? Well, I can tell you from my experience that that rationalizing mindset usually manifests itself before a fraud or other misconduct is, is actually discovered. Okay, that, that rational mind, mindset is there. The case you worked on, Senior Vice President of Financial Reporting, passed over for promotion. Okay, still a big job, very important job, near retirement. There was another job this individual wanted, passed over for it, and had this perceived grievance against the company. This individual, uh, colluding with someone else inside the organization, committed a fairly large fraud, $7 million of fraud. Uh, and the people that I, they were shocked, they were dumbfounded this happened. The person worked there for, I don't know, decades. Everybody knew him well, enjoyed his company, would go out to lunch with him. And they thought back and they said, you know what? The last six months, man, this guy's had a grievance against the company, just constantly stirring the pot, was upset, was whatever. And you know what? We should have thought about then that he had some perceived grievance with the company. It was already that rationalizing mindset that, that, that was coming uh, forward, manifesting itself. And you know, they just didn't see it. If they had thought about it, saw it earlier and paid a little more attention to what was going on, the fraud, instead of being $7 million, maybe one, maybe five hundred, one million, maybe $500,000, it was something less. But again, people didn't see that right, rationalizing mindset. But I see it a lot in organizations. People say to you things like, you know, uh, no one takes the code of conduct seriously. Um, so they're rationalizing it, whatever. Uh, the ends justify the means. And that uh, documentary I told you about earlier, my gosh, there are rationalizations all over the place. And I've had a number of felons come in. You know, we mentioned earlier, I'm the adjunct faculty at two universities, and I will have convicted felons come in my class. And they talk about opportunities, dark and sense of pressure, all these kinds of things. But their stories are always, in a very subtle way, repeat with, uh, with, with rationalizations, things that just weren't picked up by, by people going along. But we all rationalize behaviors. We rationalize a lot of ways. I'm sure most of you aren't committing your frauds, but you're doing things and maybe not the best thing you should be doing. Perhaps you're going down the road a bit fast and you're speeding, the speed limit 65 miles an hour and you're going 80. You rationalize that behavior. Well, everybody else is going 80. I should go 80. Still doesn't make it right, but you just rationalize the fact that you were breaking the law. And you, it's interesting when people start thinking about it. And I think about it a lot and talking to people all the time, even loved ones, they're talking about something. And like, I'm, I'm just like, hey, you're rationalizing something. Uh, so it's a really important concept it's a lost in the shuffle a little bit. But again, keep an eye on those kinds of things. You can actually spot things a whole lot earlier in the process. So what are organizations doing to mitigate risk? Well, they design, implement, and evaluate, design, implement, and evaluate policies, programs, controls uh, to prevent, detect, and respond to integrity risks. So you've got to design, implement, and evaluate these things. And these things are policies, programs, and controls. And they're, in, they're designed essentially to prevent, detect, and respond to fraud and misconduct. 
That's what you have to do. Sounds simple. What I've done here, I put a slide together for you. And I got a bunch of things on there, all broken into prevent, detect, and, uh, uh, and respond. So, you know, print, I want to keep things from uh, happening to start with. That's, that's the best. Uh, if things, you know, controls are going to break down, bad things are going to happen, I want to make sure I detect them. Um, you know, not the best case scenario, but better than, than, than not catching it. Uh, but where a lot of my clients would break, not break down, but wouldn't do as good a job as on response. They were never, they could have all these preventative things in place and some detective, my gosh, it was amazing how few actually thought about what are we going to do if something goes wrong. Uh, I could teach an entire course because I teach uh, forensic accounting, I teach um, ethics and the financial reporting, I teach, uh, these are the things I'm teaching most recently, um, um, uh, uh, business risks in a global digital economy. <clears throat> and I could, I could teach a whole other course just on the things that are on this slide. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through them all. I'll talk about a couple of them. First one on the prevention, fraud, misconduct, risk assessments. I have to say, if you're going to do nothing else, at least do an assessment and understand where your risks are. The only way you can truly mitigate your risks or address your risk or what have you is to um, you know, assess what those risks are. Otherwise, you have no idea what you're talking about. And some others here, the code of conduct and related standards. Code of conduct, I believe, is not given enough credit in organizations. Not given enough credit. Your employees and people in organizations have to understand their affirmative obligation, either to do the right thing, and also the affirmative obligation to report wrongdoing. How do you communicate to that to them? Well, you communicate it through the code of conduct, and then you train on the code of conduct. So everybody knows they have an affirmative obligation, not only to do the right thing, but if they see something going on, they, they have an affirmative obligation to report what they're seeing going on. Most of the vast majority of all the uh, frauds and misconduct I've become aware of in my career <clears throat> are from tips, vast majority. Uh, there are other mechanisms going on, but most of them come through tips. <clears throat> Sometimes um, uh, anonymous tips, but even those tips, you know, are, are people inside the organization, you can tell. And some other things. Third party, uh, you know, due diligence on employees and third parties, the communication and training, uh, controls and what have you, but a lot of things you can do. Detection, hotlines and whistleblower. I just got done telling you most of the frauds and, and misconduct being aware of, someone has reported it, anonymously, non-anonymously, whatever has, happens to be. You know, you gotta uh, put mechanisms in place that are easy, convenient for people to use and things that they think uh, they're safe using, okay? That you're not gonna betray their trust, be no retaliation, all those kinds of things. On the investigative side, <clears throat> I got a bunch of protocols listed here. You have to have these protocols in place. When there is an integrity breakdown, you've discovered it, you've gotta respond. So, you know, how do we do an investigation? You have to have some sort of protocol for that. How do you enforce these things and how do you hold people accountable for things? You need, you need policies, programs, controls for that. Disclosure protocols. So many clients I know have discovered serious misconduct or fraud in the organization. Nah, no sense of what to do next about, you know, do we disclose this in financials? Do we not disclose in financials? And they're just flopping around for a while. And probably the most important thing in, in response is remedial action protocols. You got to remedy the harm caused. You got to fix the control weaknesses. You got to do all of these kinds of things. And a lot of companies I know, they got a problem. They, they, they slap together an investigative team. They do a few things, but then they correct none of these problems going forward. But you literally have to have in place the kinds of protocols and what have you to say, hey, as soon as we have a problem, we understand the problem. This is how we remediate some of it. <clears throat> what I want to do now is introduce you <clears throat> to a couple of interesting guys. Uh, I know both these guys. Uh, they've uh, spoken to my classes before. They, they know I'm talking about them, so I don't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking out of turn with them. But they allow us a lot of insight into the, some of the stuff I'm talking about and really how do you, what are we going to really learn from what I'm talking about here? Uh, the first one's Matthew Cox. Uh, uh, 
and it says here he falsified documentation and led his victims into believing that he owned properties on which he fraudulently obtained numerous mortgages from uh, multiples of the property's actual value. Uh, he earned a spot on the Secret Service's most wanted list. Um, that's his most wanted poster there. Um, and his frauds netted up to $25 million. He got, he spent over 12 and a half years in prison. And actually, he spoke on my classes. He was only out of prison for a couple of weeks, spoke on one of my classes. Uh, he's an interesting guy. Um, actually, enjoyed uh, chatting with him. Now, he was also an American Greed episode all about this guy. But a fascinating thing was he was on the verge, well, he was caught a bunch of times. A bunch of times. He was actually just, he, and matter of fact, I talked to him two weeks ago. I was, I was Tom was doing a presentation, going to talk about a story. And what, you know, lesson I wanted to get from him, I just, you know, I know, I know he's in a bank once, he was caught at the bank, he talked his way out of it, he talked his way out of a lot of things, was always on the verge of being caught. His stories actually didn't hold together very well, but nonetheless, he just kept getting away with it. He kept, uh, one time it was actually the sheriff was there, somehow managed to walk out the bank's, uh, the, the front door of the bank, uh, absolutely free when they just, they just had him, talked his way out of it. But again, with a story that just really didn't hold together. <clears throat> the next one is um, uh, Walt Pavlo. Uh, he was a senior uh, accounts receivable uh, manager at uh, MCI, uh, before MCI WorldCom, uh, in the process of helping to uh, um, hit the numbers. Uh, he had delinquent accounts. It says delinquent debts here, but he was actually hiding delinquent accounts receivable Accounts receivable is some of um, MCI's worst performing customers. Uh, in fact, uh, he hid um, about $80 million in bad debt on MCI's books. And using the mechanisms he used to hide the bad debts, working with, uh, 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 colluding with someone outside the organization, these two guys actually stole uh, $6 million dollars and, and put the money in, in the uh, Cayman Islands. Uh, he lived, uh, uh, you know, he was a senior manager. It paid okay, but you know, all this new wealth, $6 million in the Cayman Islands. I began to live a lifestyle, um, you know, uh, expensive cars, hand-tailored Italian suits, to regular vacations, a lot of them to the Cayman Islands for obvious reasons. Uh, but when he did eventually get caught and, uh, and, and served uh, two years. Uh, some of the stuff he was doing should really have been more closely questioned. In the chart of accounts, he had an account called Walt Dollars. Uh, there is no account that should be called Walt Dollars. If it had a house working company, there should be no Tim Dollars. Uh, he had another account called the, the, you know, the, the check is in the mail account. Lots of things like that. Nothing was ever really corroborated that it was doing. Um, so, but like like uh, Matthew, though, you know, uh, uh, amazing lifestyle, no corroborating things he said, stories really not uh, holding together, should have been caught a lot earlier than they were. In fact, with uh, Walt, who I've actually presented with Walt over 70 times uh, together, uh, you know, it's like, no one ever corroborated him. He was always in the verge of being caught. No one ever caught him in a timely way. Uh, Matthew wasn't caught in a timely way, and I could I could put down a lot of people I know in slides here about how you know I'm always on the verge, stories not hanging together, but you know what, you're just not being caught in a timely way. Eventually, all these guys get caught, but again, it was it could have been a whole lot sooner. But why not? Why not? Why weren't they caught sooner? Now, perhaps uh, people do not exhibit those they were dealing with, or, or possess a sufficient are uh, high enough degree of skepticism, of skepticism. Didn't have enough skepticism. They're hearing these things. Uh, they're, they're getting audit evidence from Wall, not corroborating it. Why aren't they corroborating? Well, they're not being skeptical enough. They're just taking him at his word when they probably shouldn't have been. And again, what I'm gonna talk about here, <clears throat> I think really is the most important takeaway of my, uh, my presentation. Uh, I think it is the biggest problem facing the accounting profession. Um, I'm sorry, uh, auditing profession, not the accounting profession. Couldn't say that when I was at KPMG, uh, but I can say it to you. I think the lack of skepticism is a huge problem in that space. And I mentioned to you as a group, because I know a lot of you are accounting students. Um, skepticism is a hugely 
complex topic. I mean, doing some research with a, a stellar scholar I, I know very, very well, starting to get into this topic a little bit more because I know it's a big problem in the auditing profession elsewhere, big problem in your day-to-day -day lives. But I was like, you know, started getting into it and you realize there's some, um, uh, you know, uh, philosophical skepticism, uh, Cartesian skepticism, Voltairean skepticism, scientific skepticism, dogmatic skepticism, nihilistic skepticism. It's a hugely complex topic. It's a hugely complex topic. And obviously I can't get into all of those areas of skepticism. I don't even think I know them that well, other than just sort of list them out for you. Uh, but you can say something about it. Uh, it, it essentially is an attitude that questions the reliability of claims made by others. It's an attitude that questions the reliability of claims made by others. Okay. Um, you know, having that doubting state of mind, whatever it happens to be. <clears throat> uh, and that's what was lacking, I think, in the case of like um, uh, Matthew, in the case of Walter, that, you know, People weren't really, you know, they were over relying upon people, the things that uh, people said. Uh, they just didn't have, they weren't really questioning reliability. People say, this happens all the time. It happens all the time to people. People are trying to sell you get rich quick schemes or whatever, or multi-level marketing uh, ideas. And again, you're not really sufficiently questioning uh, the claims that are made by others. There are a couple of things, other things we can say about skepticism. Um, there are trait and state components of skepticism. With the state component of skepticism, behavior depends upon situational influences. Okay, so the situation you're in can heighten your level of skepticism. It's usually temporary. You know, I'm always not in this situation. If you suddenly became aware that, uh, uh, now passed away, but Bernie Madoff was on the, uh, on the board of a company you happen to be auditing, or think of buying into, well, that would be a state skepticism because wow, Bernie Madoff's there, you know, and we got a problem here. Uh, but again, it's temporary. And, you know, if you're doing an audit or what have you, you know that, you know, some of the companies or the companies engaged in inappropriate transactions. Well, the state is such that, hey, I'm more skeptical. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a skeptical. Uh, trade skepticism is, a, is behavior that is um, uh, dispositional. It is a mindset. It's just the way you are. Uh, you know, we all, I, 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 it's purely an anecdotal observation on my part. Everybody thinks they're really hyper skeptical. Uh, I, tr I had to work on my own skepticism and I think everybody's lying to me all the time uh, only because of what I've done for a living for, for decades. Uh, but even then I have to learn even to be more skeptical than I am. And I, I know people who have fallen for what I think are you know, really obvious schemes still think they're very skeptical people or they fix their skepticism, what have you. But you know what, chances are you're not skeptical enough. You know, you, know, you can't, you know, how, how do you become skeptical? You know, I, you know what, I can't even tell you how to become skeptical. I really can't. Um, I don't know what it is to make you skeptical. Uh, the best I can do, at least for the purposes of this uh, conversation, is to make you, um, I can tell you why you're not skeptical. You know, what are the barriers to it? Okay, what are the barriers to skepticism? Uh, and there are a lot of uh, barriers to skepticism. Uh, for example, we have uh, uh, subconscious implicit prejudices uh, that, uh, that, that, that plague people. Uh, there are things that take place that we're not even aware of. Uh, we have in, in our minds uh, unconscious tendencies uh, to automatically associate concepts with one another. We're not even aware of it. We associate one concept with another uh, subconsciously or implicitly and not even aware of it. Uh, you know, and you hear a lot about this now when people are talking about uh, culture in an organization or what have you, that people are, you know, you, you got to improve these kinds of things, understand that subconsciously you're making judgments about people. Well, you know, people do it in business and you do it in day-to-day -day life, uh, even outside of the notion of uh, organizational culture. Uh, there, you know, some really related concept called uh, prestige bias. There's a very famous uh, research uh, from uh, um, 1982 where these uh, researchers 
uh, sent to, and I believe they're psychology journals, very prestigious psychology journals. They sent them papers they already published. What they did was they put on fake names in the papers and they changed the schools of affiliation for the authors. So before the authors published papers were with very prestigious journals. Now they're not, All right? Fake name, not a prestigious journal. They sent it off to see what would happen. Well, kind of surprisingly, uh, of all those uh, papers they sent out, only 8% were actually returned saying, hey, we've already published this thing. So I left a lot of, most papers were actually being considered. Of those, or of the total, I believe it was 89% of the papers were found to be deficient uh, with respect to the methodology employed and things like that. None of them returned because of plagiarism, but suddenly, uh, methodologically speaking, this is, this is not the kind of standard that, that we usually have. So again, there was some sort of implicit or some uh, subconscious bias to what was going on. That was called a prestige bias in that particular case. But there are a lot of other really interesting examples. There's research that suggests that if you are a Yankees fan, you don't trust Red Sox fans. And it's a subconscious thing. You're making this association. There's no basis whatsoever for the association. I don't follow sports. And I can tell you the Red Sox fan is equally untrustworthy as a Red Sox fan. But again, that only makes sense. I mean, it, it, it can't be more uh, trustworthy than others. And I've, I've watched it in auditing. Uh, people went to the same school as somebody else. You know, they, they, they seem to have more trust in that individual. It's also one of the reasons in auditing that having your former auditors for the auditing firm working for the client is a fraud risk factor in an audit partially because those people understand what you're doing. Also, it's because if they went to the, you, you both worked at the same firm, you, maybe you're in the same class, they call them classes when you, when you come in, uh, right out of school and what have you. Um, again, you know, you, you, you trust those people more than, than maybe you should. Um, but I thought it was fascinating research because there really is no um, real reason for why Red Sox people would be more or less trustworthy than Yankees people. A lot of times when I'm speaking, I give that example, a lot of people do chime in and say, yes, they don't trust Red Sox fans, they don't trust Yankees fans, but the reality is there is no reason. Match.com, uh, a couple of years ago, they had published some research and the people who owned iPhones were less likely, much less likely to date people who um, uh, had um, Android phones. Again, there was some sort of bias built to this thing that you know truly didn't make um, a, a, a whole lot of sense. But nonetheless, um, it, it exists. The next one's confirmation bias. And uh, for those of you to be auditors, I was told before the session started that many of you were uh, accounting students and many of you become auditors, what have you. I know we have some uh, audit uh, professors listening to this presentation. This is the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems facing the auditing profession. We have a tendency uh, to interpret new evidence as confirming existing beliefs or theories. We interpret new evidence or evidence uh, that is presented as confirming our own, our already held beliefs. We also have a natural tendency, natural human tendency to distrust disconfirming evidence, to distrust disconfirming evidence. And I can't tell you how many people got themselves wrapped up into schemes that whatever evidence they were thinking about, looking about, whatever indicia there was that this may not be a good thing, doesn't look like a good thing. Well, I'm, I'm going to discount that evidence, but here's something that says, hey, this looks like a good idea and a, and a viable investment. I'm, I'm going to put my money in there. It's one of the reasons people fall, you know, like Ponzi schemes or whatever, and a lot of these things. There always is the fear of missing out, but again, a lot of evidence there that suggests this doesn't quite work. But there is some evidence this looks like a really good thing. I'm going to put all my faith because this is my belief in the confirming evidence. I'm going to ignore or, or, or distrust or uh, uh, discount the disconfirming uh, uh, data. I always told auditors they should be, uh, when they're thinking about audit evidence, actively look for disconfirming audit evidence. None of the firms will tell you to do that. It's not in the auditing standards. Um, but um, I, I just got to notice that there's some questions from the uh, from the uh, uh, audience. What I'll do, um, uh, Professor Kim, is I will wait because uh, I don't have much time left in my uh, 
in my presentation here. So I'll just finish this up and then I'll do the questions if that's okay with you. Uh, so uh, ambiguity, wherever there's ambiguity, bias thrives. There's a lot of ambiguity in accounting treatment. Uh, if there were not ambiguity in accounting treatment, you wouldn't need <laughs> be no reason for you to be going to school. All right, we wouldn't need accountants. If there's no ambiguity in law, we wouldn't need lawyers. Wherever there's ambiguity, bias does, does thrive. Uh, tradition, tradition is another big one. We love the status quo. We love the status quo. No one wants to rock the boat. Um, I can tell you the first audit I ever worked on was at a college bookstore. And I was sent to the college bookstore. I first audit and went there by myself. And here's the audit program. This is what the work we did last year and the year before and the year before that. And you go there, do this. And the expectation was I was going to come back with the same answer. Again, that notion of the status quo and what have you, this is the way tradition, the way things are always done. And when you're thinking that way, uh, your antennae with respect to skepticism uh, goes down. Time pressures. And this is a big one again in auditing. You're under a lot of pressure. And for those of you who become auditors, you're going to be blown away by the pressure at the end of the year. A couple days before sign off, so much work yet to be done. There are certain budgets you have to adhere to. And when those, that pressure is on you, you know, you suspend skepticism just to get to the job. We also spend skepticism a lot of times when you're told, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. My family owned an automobile dealership. I grew up in the automobile business. <laughs> I'm not saying that's why I became a friends accountant, but I grew up in the automobile business. And what was the greatest sales tactic ever? Ah, someone's gonna buy this car tomorrow, right now, where that guy sit over there, he wants this car. You gotta make a decision. As soon as you made a decision, as soon as you, you put the pressure on them, the time pressure on them, People lower the guard. They made decisions. Uh, you know, perhaps you could have made decisions that they probably should have not, should not have made. Uh, familiarity. Um, it's it's you know again, your your guard comes down and there's familiarity with the people uh, that you're working with. You know them. You're comfortable with them. At audit firm, when you're doing an audit, um, you wind up spending a lot of time with with the audit client. Become familiar with them. Become more trusting of them. Um, and again, you know, a lot of these multi-level marketing uh, schemes or pyramid schemes that come out are usually sold to you by somebody who, who knows you or is trying to push you this, but knows you well as a friend of yours, those kinds of things. So again, familiarity, um, again, brings down that, that uh, what could be a natural skepticism. And I can't tell you how to be skeptical, but it is a life lesson. And if you think about why you're not skeptical and you try to improve upon those things, it might make a huge difference. And uh, Professor Kim, I think I will move on to some Q&A. Great, thank you very much. We have a lot of great questions that have come in. Um, this one is a bit of a twofold, so I'm just gonna read you both and you can address them in whatever order you'd like. Um, with the economic impact of COVID-19 on businesses, what patterns have you seen in fraud and misconduct? And also, what are your thoughts on and recommendations for future auditors in detecting and mitigating these enhanced risks and fraud? Um, with respect to um, uh, the, uh, the pandemic and uh, the frauds uh, that I've seen, the kinds of things I've been called on, a lot of it has to do with new opportunities. When you, the same thing happened in 2008, 2009, when the government was reacting to the uh, to the meltdown, and you're pouring tons of money into the into the system, there's going to be somebody out there trying to take the money. So most of the stuff I've seen right now has been on the side of trying to get an undue share uh, of, of of some of the funds that are being made available. Uh, if you're auditing a company like that, I mean, understanding whether or not they're entitled to those funds and the appropriate disp uh, disposition of them uh, would be important. Uh, people going into uh, the profession and thinking about it, uh, all these uh, government programs come with a lot of strictures around them about how things are supposed to be done, what makes you qualify for something, those kinds of things, awareness of those things. But I can tell you that um, it's just, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about just the money being available. Well, money is available there now. Government's pouring some of it out that they can't possibly uh, 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 track all this money or fear who's taken and who's going places with it. But um, 
but nothing's new with respect to how the money is, uh, is stolen, how fraud takes place and what have you. Uh, but again, there are, there are more opportunities only because the, velocity, the cash velocity is, is completely insane. I don't know if the answer is the question, but that's kind of the way I look at it. Thank you. Um, what industries do you think are particularly vulnerable to fraud from what you've seen? Uh, there's a lot of research in which ones are vulnerable to fraud or are vulnerable to misconduct. Um, my, my whole screen just changed here for a second. Um, uh, you know, it, it depends on the organization. I talked about corruption before. Uh, if you're big pharma, you're a medical device company uh, doing business globally, uh, you've got a massive risk uh, around um, um, violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act because of socialized medicine overseas. Um, certain industries uh, like telecom and software and like those uh, have uh, heightened uh, uh, risks for uh, fraudulent financial reporting. Um, each one of them is a little bit, it's, it's not that one is more susceptible than another, they're all susceptible in different ways. Uh, the opportunities are a bit different and the kinds of pressures that they're under are, are different. But it's not like, wow, that's a really corrupt industry. Well, um, uh, you know, uh, carding companies for a corrupt industry, but uh, it's, it's not like, hey, this industry is really at risk of fraud. They're all risk of fraud. It's all different kinds of fraud. And the maturity of an individual company is gonna make a big difference with respect to their uh, susceptibility. Again, it's not a direct answer, but it will, it will vary industry and industry and what risks they face and do. Thank you. Um, another question is technology is always growing very quickly, which includes technology used within the accounting profession. Do you think that technology hurts or helps the amount of fraud committed or the ability to detect fraud? Uh, I'll do an analogy. <clears throat> um, you know, police came out with radar, uh, drivers came out with radar detectors, police came out with laser, drivers came out with laser detectors. Uh, the, the good guys, the, uh, the space where the friends of people in the autos uh, lie, are, are kind of a step behind uh, the technology being deployed by the, by the bad guys. That's the way it's always going to be. Uh, what I found is that it's not so much it's changed the nature of the frauds, it's actually changed the velocity of them. I mean, the fundamental financial statement frauds are, are, are essentially the same and been the same for a long, long time. Uh, the ease of, uh, of um, uh, uh, perpetrating them or, or affecting them is, is, is changed. Same token now that with the tools we have, accountants, auditors, and frenzy people can look at 100% of all transactions. Uh, but it's always a one-upmanship thing. So yeah, it makes life a little bit easier to the bad guys, but the good guys are also deploying a lot of technology to combat this. Uh, where I've seen it to be, be different um, is in you know the cyber crime space. But even some of that, when I've when I've done work uh, with the companies and thinking about uh, uh, you know um, theft of uh, accounts and things like that, it's essentially the stuff they've been doing for years. They're just using technology to do it. It's like the fundamental uh, essence of the frauds is the same, just the speed and the nature of which way they uh, perpetrate it uh, is changing. Thank you. Um, one last question, um, just to kind of keep in with the uh, time allotted. Um, Bernie Madoff conducted the world's largest Ponzi scheme, but he was also once a chairman of the NASDAQ. How would you combat someone with a good reputation from committing fraud? Well, I don't think it is a question actually. He, he was with um, uh, NASDAQ, it wasn't very long that he was there. Uh, his, um, uh, um, you know, his, his perceived greatness, wherever you want to call it, was actually driven uh, not so much by the NASDAQ thing, but as his philanthropy and his success in, in doing things he was doing. Um, but that was also part and, part, uh, part and parcel of why uh, he was successful. If you actually look at Charles Ponzi from whom the Ponzi scheme is named after, uh, if you saw him, he drove the you know, biggest car in the Boston area, had a massive house, uh, the dress was unbelievable, people wanted to live like him, they saw it as, as a success. A lot of that stuff just masks 
you know, and, uh, uh, some other underlying issues. But I, you can't just look at someone who's successful on paper and, and leading you toward investment and say, well, man, uh, it, it doesn't make sense. You have to do your due diligence. But you're not going to stop someone like that from, from misbehaving, per se. Your goal is not to fall for the scheme. And that's It's a lot of due diligence, that skeptical mindset. Uh, when anybody is, is uh, uh, doing something that seems too good to be true, and I think that sounds trite, but in a case like Madoff, and you're getting a consistently decent return in regards to marketing conditions, you know what, that doesn't exist. Uh, uh, Ponzi, the returns he was paying, they just didn't make sense, but his obvious success and the fact people are getting money and that notion of FOMO, the fear of missing out, um, you know, it, it takes over and what have you. It's all about, again, going back to about the notion of skepticism and corroborating things people are saying there. Uh, telling you something, how do you corroborate? If someone give, comes to you with a, a scheme and the uh, a formula for the investments is is you know top secret or whatever, because uh, they don't want to disclose because everybody will do it. If you can't corroborate or understand what they're doing, you, you got to walk away from it. it. But it's easier said than done because you don't want to be the person that misses out. Right. Well, thank you so much for such an evening, a delightful evening of um, intellect and great discussion. Some of the students have class at 630. So um, we're going to uh, put uh, closure to this event. I want to say thank you uh, so much, Dr. Tim Headley, for um, your time and a great lecture. I want to say thank you to all the students and everybody have a great evening. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.